you all right? I'm not so bad. I'm not so bad. Always smiling, always ready to go. You know how it is. Yep, we're smiling even though we no longer have a queen. There is that. Yeah. You no. Know, so, I mean, and to be perfectly honest with you, um, however much I may not be a royalist, um, I appreciate a certain uh, thing with the monarchy, which is that stopped Boris Johnson becoming a dictatorship. Yes. Which I always appreciate. And also I appreciate that there are people out there that really do bloody love the monarchy and they will be feeling pain right now. So I have complete respect for their grieving process. Yep. Same page. Same yeah. page. So, you know, that's absolutely fine. So, you know, any mocking I do of it is always done from a kind of all cheeky British humour type of thing rather than any kind of viscerally punching up, which I know that some comedians would probably try and do on a regular basis. But anyways, yes. so yes, a bit of word. Thanks, Mom. Actually, she was really um, keen on the arts and everything, wasn't she? I mean, how many, 10 poet laureates I think she had. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, it's that working out to be one every seven years. So that's Something going like through that. a hell of a lot of poets. <laughs> but she's just I mean she was a she was a patron of the arts you know she did actually yeah. throw her weight behind things uh quite often so you know that was that was nice to see I didn't realize actually how much she put into the arts until the 24 hour a day rolling coverage of what the queen used to do um yeah you know which we could have done with a little bit more of that actually when she was alive to be honest but it would be nice to celebrate things while she was um, yeah. somebody, um, did you see on Facebook somebody describe the BBC at the moment as Mourn Hub? <laughs> <laughs> no, I hadn't seen that. Yeah. Oh, that's ace. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Clever people. Yeah. That's why the internet, isn't it? That's that's why yeah. the internet. Fucking brilliant. Yeah. I actually used the joke today, actually, from, a, from an internet thing. Um there's somebody had posted up about ruin a ruin a movie title or singulate a movie title. Oh know? yeah. So they put on Jaw, right? Uh, instead of Jaws, so it's just Jaw. And I'd noticed one on Twitter, so I've just repeated it when somebody else has done it, which was a crow on the more a crow on the Orient Express. That's just so clever. Uh, it's got to be so. It's got to be yeah. pushed around that, hasn't it? Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> so yes so whoever yeah. came up with that originally well done don't know who you are but i'm stealing it on a regular basis what were we re what were we reading this week what we were reading this week we actually pushed the boat out this week and mm -hmm. went yeah. for a long form um because this week we were reading the green mile by stephen king yes and I'm going to state right now, I'm going to read the synopsis from Wikipedia because, to be perfectly honest with you, I, there are names in this that I don't want to make. You know my usual synopsis, I'm all over the place. But there are certain elements of this that I want to get absolutely spot on. Yeah. Secondly, before I get into the synopsis, if you have not read The Green Mile and you've only seen the movie, I'm going to put in a caption, I'm going to put in the, um, the, the, the test card uh, so that you can go off and read it, because you need to go off and read the book. Yeah. So that we don't spoil, because we are going to spoil the hell out of it, and there is a lot in the book that isn't in the movie. So, yes, you know, you you don't know if you've only watched the movie, you don't know the full extent of the Green Mile. You know, you know a lot of it, but you don't know the, the full extent of it. So we're going to have the test card now. <laughs> Welcome back. So, and I will say, if you've only seen the movie, in that case, you've seen the Green Kilometer rather than the Green Mile. <laughs> uh, Very brilliant. Right. Okay. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to read this from Wikipedia. Wikipedia considers the plot of the Green Mile to be this, featuring a first person narrative told by Paul Edgecombe. The novel switches between Paul as an old man in Georgia Pines nursing home, writing down his story in 1996 and his time in 1932 as the block supervisor of the Cold Mountain Penitentiary Death Row, nicknamed the Green Mile for the colour of the floors, Lilo. This year marks the arrival of John Coffey, a six foot eight inch 
2.03 meter tall, powerful, powerfully built black man who has been convicted of raping and murdering two young white girls. During his time on the mile, John interacts with fellow prisoners, uh, Edure Del Delacrox, a Cajun arsonist, rapist, and murderer, and William Wanton, Billy the Kid to himself, Wild Bill to the guards, an unhinged and dangerous multiple murderer who is determined to make as much trouble as he can before he is executed. Other inhabitants include Arlen Bitterbuck, a Native American convicted of killing a man in a fight over a pair of boots, Arthur Flanders, a real estate executive who killed his father to perpetuate insurance fraud, and Mr. Jingles, a mouse to whom Dell teaches various tricks. Paul and the other guards are irritated throughout the book by Percy Wetmore, a sadistic guard who enjoys antagonising the prisoners. The other guards have to be civil to him despite their dislike of him because he is the nephew of the governor's wife. When Percy is offered an administrative position at a nearby Brer Ridge psychiatric hospital, Paul thinks they are finally rid of him. However, Percy refuses to leave until he is allowed to supervise an execution. So Paul hesitantly allows him to run Dell's. Percy deliberately avoids soaking a sponge in brine that is supposed to tuck inside the electrode cap to ensure a quick death in the electric chair. When the switch is thrown, the current causes Dell to catch fire in the chair and suffer a prolonged and agonising demise. Over time, Paul realises that John possesses inexplicable healing abilities, which he uses to cure Paul's urine tract infection and revive Mr Jingles after Percy stomps on him. Simple-minded and shy, John is very empath empathic and sensitive to the thoughts and feelings of others around him. One night, the guards drug Wharton, then put a straitjacket on Percy and lock him in the padded res restrainant room so that they can smug smuggle John out of prison and take him to the home of Warden Hal Moores. Hal's wife, Melinda, has an inoperable brain tumour, which John cures. When they return to the mile, John passes the disease of Melinda into Percy, causing him to go mad and shoot Wharton to death before falling into a catatonic state from which he never recovers. Percy is then committed to Brian Ridge as a patient. Paul's long simmering suspicion that John is innocent are proven right when he discovers that it was actually Wharton who raped and killed the two girls and that John was trying to revive them. Later, John tells Paul what he saw when Wharton grabbed his arm one time. One time. How Wharton had coerced the sisters to be silent by threatening to kill one if the other made a noise. Using their love for each other, Paul uh, is unsure how to help John, but John tells him not to worry, as he is already as he is ready to die anyway, wanting to escape the cruelty of the world. John's execution is the last one in which Paul participates. As Paul approaches the conclusion of his written story, he offers it to his friend Elaine Connolly to read. As she finishes doing so, he introduces Mr Jingles to her before the mouse dies, having lived for 64 years past these events. Paul explains that those healed by John gained an unnatural long lifespan. Elaine dies shortly after, never learning how Paul's wife died in his arms immediately after they were involved in a bus accident in 1956, and that he then saw John's ghost watching him from an overpass. Paul seems to be all alone, now 104 years old, and wondering how much longer he will live. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely, yes. And so, in words of one swear, what did you think of it? It remains one of my favourite stories of Stephen King's. It's just, yeah, it's just absolutely superb. Um, I think the plotting, the pacing, the characters that are involved in that, um, the description, everything about it, it's just an absolute joy. Yeah. It's just a shame it's so problematic, isn't it? Well, it is It is, and it isn't. I think one of the most amazing things about this story is it really tells the time so well. You know, it's it, um, and it tells it from that historical point of view. It's deliberately problematic, and it has to be deliberately problematic, um, from from in order to be able to sell it. It's a bit like I put it on par with things like To Kill a Mockingbird, right? In that, I think it really highlights and holds a uh, holds a mirror up to um, how society was then, particularly in the Deep South. That yep. basically being black was no defence. Um, yeah, no, I I agree with that, and I think um, I think yeah, it needed to be problematic to address those issues because I think if John Coffey had been white in that case, he would have gotten off. Yeah. Um, but um, the thing that I think is problematic is the fact that um, by the end of this story, we are cheering for a murderer because John Coffey has used Percy Wetmore as a gun to kill Wild Bill Wharton. Yeah, but that is that is a, it's a very interesting uh, analogy, that, isn't it? Well, not analogy. I'm using completely the wrong words. Um, okay. What, sorry? It's been a long day. It has been a long day. I have done some amazing te amazing teaching today. Um, no, I think that's a kind of a case of a bit like double jeopardy. If you are going to coup if you are going to kill me for a crime I didn't commit, I might as well commit the crime. Yeah, I can I can see you saying that because you're a belligerent twat. But <laughs> John Coffey isn't a belligerent twat. John Coffey is is God's chosen vessel on this earth. That is being be murdered by the state, yep. having been fitted up by one of the people that is guarding him, and you know, it or is in prison with him, and therefore the anger that comes out of that is different. It's it's like it's almost like a crime of passion in a way. You know, he is going to die for what that person has done. And so why not just kill that person anyway? Everyone's going to die out of this. It doesn't matter. So it's it, it's almost inconsequential in the crime itself. I, I like what you're saying there, but a crime of passion doesn't, to my mind, fit in with the character of John Coffey, who is so accepting of the fate that's been foisted upon him. Even to the point where they sort of like say, look, we've got to take you down to the electric chair. We've got to zap you. Um, he's there saying, well, I don't mind. I'm tired. I'm fed up with all of this now. Um, I'm just so tired of the world's ugliness. Um, so somebody who's at that stage of having given up on everything, it's hard to imagine them having the passion to think, oh, but before I go, let's sort of like get this with here and um, yeah, turn him catatonic after he's shot Billy the Kid. I would, I would say, probably more likely to explode in that way. I think when a lot of people are very, very calm and get on with things, I, I, I put it into a job scenario. I mean, granted, you're not going to suddenly psychically give someone cancer and cause them to shoot somebody else, but how many times have you been going above and beyond in a job? You know, Everybody. because you want it to be right. And yeah. then how angry and absolutely furious you are when you find out that the reason you're having to go above and beyond is because some other twat isn't doing their job properly. Yes. So you can do it because you have to. 
and then realize that you shouldn't be doing it. And that can drive you really, really, you know, uh, wild. And to be perfectly honest with you, I mean, remember, like you say, he is, I'm not even sure of the correct terms nowadays, um, educationally challenged. He is, um, yeah, uh, you know, probably, he has, he, so he, he is retrograded in his, in, in his thought patterns and stuff like that. He is, uh, uh, arrested development in, in the way he looks forward. Now I, I do work with children that have autism and I have seen these flips, these flips that happen perfectly placid children all day. And then yeah. one person steals their orange and the entire classroom gets completely wiped out. You know, so I, it's, I don't think that is, you know, that's not his constant demeanor. He gives up because he's in a no win situation. And then when he finds out that he shouldn't really be there and that there is the person that should be doing it and he could have been saved all along. I can see that rage coming out at that point. That to me is a genius of what Stephen King did. Um, I get what you're saying and I'm tempted to agree with you. But before we move on to me, <laughs> you, right. Um, we have John Coffey, who yes. is educationally subnormal, if that's not offensive. Um, even if it is offensive, I apologise, but that's the yes. term. Um, we've got John Coffey who's like that. Um, we've got. Um, He's got these magical superpowers, but he seems to have a range of magical superpowers. Not only can he heal people with his magic hands, but also he suddenly has the magical ability, which comes in at the 11th hour, probably in book six of these six books that were the Green Mile, where somebody touches his arm and he's got a psychic connection to them. There's... That device is only used in that one instance. He's not got a psychic connection to anybody else anywhere throughout this story. He's just sort of like comparatively slow witted. Um, and right. this is not me being racist, but the only things that we're getting to convince us that he's innocent are his story about what he picked up from psychic vibes and circumstantial evidence from Tom Hanks going out and sort of like chatting with various people who didn't bother speaking up properly at the trial. That and the fact that he was a black in a Southern courtroom with an, uh, you know, an all white jury that would never have found him innocent anyway. Um, but, right. I agree with you. <laughs> it's not me trying to be racist, but if it had been a six foot eight white bloke, six foot eight white bloke who is educationally subnormal, sitting on the banks of the river with two dead girls in his arms, saying, um, I couldn't take it back, I think he would have been frying just as much as John Coffey. If it was John White Coffey who was sort of like sat there. I don't know. I that's one of the things that I that's why I related to to kill a mockingbird. I think that if he if he was a um educationally challenged white dude that sat on the side of the the whole thing um if they caught him in the middle of the act they probably still would have gone out to try and find some black geezer around the place and fit him up for it because that really it's it's so like it was a lot like that. It was very lynch mob back then anyway, wasn't it? You know, yeah. set in 1932. So you're talking about the Depression. You're talking about, um, you know, the, the time of... Um, I mean, a classic case of that is, is Of Mice and Men, isn't it? With the... What's That's his name? Lenny. I was thinking, yeah. Yeah. And Lenny, they were about to lynch him, weren't they? When yeah, lynch, but they were um... just going to lynch him. That was, you know... and that, But he was hurried out. He was, he was kind of protected. He was never arrested. He was never taken... He ended up getting killed by his mate um, just to stop him doing it again, you know, because... He... Was it to stop him doing it again, or was it because he knew that he would end up sort of like either getting lynched, hung, punished, or suffering at the hands of the crowd who were going to get him? Yeah, it, that, that was... It was... It was. Uh, I think the argument in it... It's been so long since I've read it. Um, I think the argument was if he was an animal, it would be the kindest thing to do. Yeah. Some, that was the kind of argument that was being put across that it wasn't it wasn't just so much to stop him getting killed in such a horrendous and horrific way 
as being caught by the lynch mob. But he's actually done this previous, and that's why they've kept moving, and that it was now time to not keep moving on, and it was better for him to not have these worries of accidentally killing folk, you know, for because he's just a big, large, lumbering lump of a man. Um, I think, yeah. Um, I think you're absolutely right with this story. I think um, my head just went into contentious plates as whilst I was reading it. <laughs> but as I said, I really, really do love it. Um, I think one of the best things this book does is it presents such a solid argument against the death penalty. Yes. Even though the one person who goes there who wants to be killed by the machine is the hero or the heroic tool of the story, Um and shouldn't have been killed. And the one person whose death is portrayed as being violent and unpleasant um, is somebody who potentially, for want of a better word, deserved a violent and unpleasant death. Yes. He'd raped a girl, and then to hide the crime, he'd sort of like set fire to the body and ended up burning down a house and killing other people. So, yeah, um, a horrific, terrible crime. Yet we end up not just feeling sorry for the man, but falling in love with his shitty pet mouse as well. <laughs> Look, there's a, there's a, there's, I mean, there's the thing about this story. This is one, this is one of my favorite Stephen King stories. And really, in a way, I, I, I quite often sit down thinking, is it actually my favorite Stephen King story? I think it's one of his cleverest because of the way that, and I think part of that is because of the way that he wrote it and, and it forced him into doing things. And we'll come to that in a little bit. But no, I, I I see where you're coming from. I do get where you're coming from, and I think that's because it's been deliberately set up to to be that. I think the idea of the you know the guy that burnt down the house accidentally by trying to hide his crime ends up burning. There's a lovely foreshadowing that goes on that kind of thing, and the yeah. mechanism of Mister Jingles as well is very important for the whole scheme of you know the, the final bit. That goes on, and and there's, there's there's lovely little questions you say about the psychic link only comes in in like book six, only that we know of, right? Because, yes. because when he when he actually touches, um, you know, I mean, well, if you're problematic, he touches Paul's, you know, cock in order yeah. to cure his urine infection, right? Yeah, there is a, the way that Paul describes this feeling that goes on. Is not just being cured, but there is this kind of connection. So you have no idea what information coffee has picked up at that point, you know, and it and it manifests the actual whatever he pulls out of him manifests as that sort of like burp of the flies. I'm gonna write the words burp of the flies down, the potential um <laughs> story for the future. Yeah. Um... But the but that is the that is the whole that's the whole thing is you don't know whether there's a psychic connection or not. It's only at the point when, it, when um, coffee admits it. Now, if, if coffee even has to admit what he's done to the others, you know, he has to admit that he's actually handed on the illness to such and such who's gone mad and then just cause him to shoot the other one. So he, otherwise they'd never have known. They'd never have known why all this had happened in that way. It, it all had to come from that co confession that you know that had to come out leading to the one scene the scene for me that is the greatest scene in the whole book that they never put in the film and that's the coach crash the coach crash in 1956 why does that one work for you it's it's not you see the the description that the plot i read out from wikipedia describes it as the ghost of coffee I don't think yeah. it is. I don't think it is a ghost. I think it's guilt. It's that whole, because it's the way that he describes it. Stephen King is the only author that has ever made me cry. Twice. Once was in Bag of Bones and once was in this. And it was that scene. And I found it so heartbreaking that his wife is dying. And it's at that point where he has the realisation that the only person that could have saved his wife he actually killed 20 years or 30 years before. Yeah. And it's that moment of love into that. And I don't think it's a ghost of coffee he sees looking down on them. I think it's he, he sees the outline of him in the rain 
as his guilt of killing something, killing someone that should never have been killed. And I think that that's that scene holds the whole lot together for me in what the whole, you know, the idea of the whole thing is the guilt. Like you say, it's one of the best stories you've ever read of of why we shouldn't yeah. have a death penalty. And that scene, it's like the trolley car, isn't it? That's that's his answer to the trolley car problem. But who do you kill? Because you don't know what's going to yeah, happen. The one on the line or the whole thing. And, you know, the the, 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 the the whole group of passengers might have the new Hitler and the one on the line might be the cure of cancer. You know, it's... It, it it creates that dilemma, and it's and it, it it's just such an incredible piece of writing, and so powerful, and so well described, and but just links everything together. It links everything that you've read until that point into one moment of absolute heartbreak. That it was just stunning. And um, for me, it wasn't just one moment of heartbreak. I was listening to this at the gym and um, crying whilst I was at the gym. I was crying when Percy um, stamped on Mr. Jingles, um, even though I've read this several times before and watched the film and know that that's not the end of Mr. Jingles. But even so, I was, yeah, yeah, weeping, saying to people nearby, it's just sweat, fuck off, I'm all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, cried at the same place that you cried, cried at the part where, um, yeah, he introduces Elaine to um, Mr. Jingles, yeah. well, grandpappy Mr. Jingles, yeah. Um, I was weeping. I think I need to increase my meds. I think this is what the problem is. Um, <laughs> clearly, um, yeah. <laughs> There's certain stresses and strains you're getting at work that's causing you to be rather emotional. No, it's. Um, it, but yeah, but it's incredibly emotional all the way yeah. through, isn't it? Yeah, it's it, it, yeah. and that's the the underlying thing. It's not so much ho the horror is is in everything that happens within the universe leading up to that bit. The horrific acts that all the inmates, except Coffee, have actually done. The horrific acts of that warden who shouldn't have been there. You know, the warden's the warden's nephew. Um, Percy, yeah. Percy, that yeah. I mean, the, the fact that he shouldn't even be in the building, you know, because he was just he was he was as bad as the other inmates. You know, that's the that's the thing with him. And and so there's a there's a huge amount of comeuppance. There's a huge amount of um um yes. Um, you're saying Percy is just as bad as the other people, but what are we basing this on? Um, I'm probably basing it on um, a Hollywood stereotype of that kind of Southern American. Um, because, yeah, um, all that he does that's wrong is he's rude to some prisoners on death row. Um, and I know that sounds like I'm understating it, but it's sort of like when he we first were introduced to him, he's dragging John Coffey onto the mail shouting, dead man walking. Yes. Um, which... We've seen that done. He's living up to the ideal stereotype of what a prison guard should be, because that's what we're told prison guards do to people who are going on death row. Um, yes, he's a vicious bully, and I'm not condoning bullying in any way, but also I would expect if you're a guard and you're working on death row, in that case, do you know what? If you're a bit of a vicious bully and it gets the job done, in that case, I say, good on you, get the job done, because those people <laughs> on death row... 99 out of 100 of them are usually there for a fucking good reason. I um, think the I trouble think is, is, this is sometimes you get the who watches the watchman, don't you? I and mean, the whole thing is, is like, it's it's what, it just happens to be on those side of the bars and when does anything stop? So when you get someone who is 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 acting in a particular way and maybe acting out of sort of like going, well, hey, look, these cunts are going to die anyway. So it doesn't matter how cruel I am to them. It doesn't matter how you know if i'm if i'm going to make them suffer now before they go and then to actually do the ultimate the ultimate suffering of not putting you know the water on the cap and and all that kind of stuff personally i'm with you in terms of any society that does in you know inflicts the death penalty cannot really genuinely claim to be um uh, an empathic society because all yeah. it is, is it's legal murder. You're doing exactly the same thing that you're that you are killing this person for. You know where does this where does that line in the sand come, and sit there and say, "I'm going to kill you for killing someone." 
it becomes that illogical. It's it's almost like the we're going to not include you because you're not inclusive. Yes, you know, that kind of argument, and I think that's that's where Stephen King deliberately had that in as a character. I think the other characters, I think the character of Paul, is probably more like the character, like uh, someone that you'd have on death row that you'd want as a guard on death row. It's not being it's not being completely empathic towards the prisoners. It's not about giving them fluffy slippers and all that kind of stuff, but just having that moment, just someone who has a moment of dignity that just sits there and goes, these people are going to die. They don't need to suffer anymore. They're getting their punishment. But to have someone who uses it as their own personal entertainment is exactly how, you know, because if you get someone who's a vicious murderer, rapist, they're doing it for their entertainment and it's, and somebody else is paying for that. And it's and I don't believe in an eye for an eye. I really don't think it's the it's the right way forward. And I think Stephen King was making that point with that character. Um, yes, I fully agree with you. But Percy Wetmore doesn't actually do anything apart from being a violent bully. He doesn't do anything that merits the the horrible sentence of being catatonic and trapped. I've got Tracy here disagreeing with me. Um, <laughs> he doesn't do anything that merits it. He, he kills a mouse, which... No, it's not. He doesn't just kill a mouse. He kills the mouse. It's, it's, there are times when the reasoning behind something is important. He kills the mouse not because he dislikes the mouse, but because he wants to torture the person whose mouse it is. That's the that's the whole thing about that. It's the whole, yes. you know, it does, that. It does it, that absolutely. Yeah. Um, but do we actually punish people for their motivation or for the crime that they've done? In horror, motivation definitely. Yeah. Yeah, but that was on death row. That sort of thing happens. Yeah, Tracy. <laughs> Tracy was just acting out the green mile so vividly there. It was like I was actually watching it again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um. <laughs> In horror, definitely. I think that's one of the, the important things as well, is it's not a historical document. It is a horror story. And I think that is what is, is also important. It is the character of Percy is over the top. It, it, I mean, he... If you take the, the you know the um, the exposition of that character out of the universe that we see, you know he would be the same character that's written into another story that is the sports locker room date raper. You know he is the the same sort of character that's having to go at the nerds at the high school. That is you know grabbing hold of the guy in the shop. Because he's 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 charging too much for a packet of cigarettes, so he beats him up, you know. And and the, he is the guy that you know, the first one with the hood on his head, chasing the, the black guy down the street in order for a lynch mob. And that's how he's kind of set up. So reading between the lines, you see that this guy is not just a mean bully; he is cruelty, you know, personified. And and the killing of the mouse, the reason for the killing of the mouse, generates that cruelty to that level. So yes, in horror films and horror movies and horror books and horror stories, damn right we kill people that are that cruel. In the real world, no, of course we don't. We don't kill anybody. You know, it's, it's very important that we have that as a as a sort of like societal line. But yeah, in horror stories, of course we kill people for doing that. We've killed them for less. <laughs> you know, I think that's part, of the, that's part of the attraction for this story because it's just so well done. Yeah, that I was forgetting it was a story. Yes, and yeah, like you said, his, it's not a historical document, and no, it's not. John Coffey didn't really exist. Neither did Percy Wetmore. Yeah. Mr. Ingalls, I'm hoping exists somewhere <laughs> and will come and visit me because, um, yeah, he his was little just... little mouse walking stick. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a great mechanism in itself, isn't it? That's the instead of actually throwing i mean when, to, just to get over the you know there you are going oh my god i've just taken all this horrendous heartbreak from his wife dying and realizing that she could have been saved but can't be saved because of the actions of her own husband you know that's it's a you know i'm surprised she didn't sort of look up at him and go paul 
you're a bastard, like a bastard, but spelt different, you know, and then, uh, but then later on we get Mr. Jingles coming out and that, that long life. And and it's actually, it doesn't even end on a happy note. It actually ends on that, like that a huge melancholy of I'm bored of life now. I'd like to die, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's yeah, it's not a cheery reaver, is really? No, isn't it? no it's not. It's, it's and and I still think I think a lot of this story is pushed by the way he wrote it by writing it originally as six books, six six chat books. Yeah, which were absolutely enthralling cliffhanger endings. Um, that yeah would rival Dan Brown's cliffhanger endings. Absolutely. Endings. Absolutely. I, I don't think I've ever read a Stephen King with better cliffhanger ending. And the way he did it as well, because he did the recaps, because that's the difference. If you read the chat books, you get little recaps at the beginning of each book. But if yes. you read it as a full book, those bits have altered because you don't have to keep recapping. So it kind of flows in between them a little bit. But I actually like the recaps. And when I originally read it, uh, there's my mate Mick had had been buying them because they came out one a month yes over six months and i was working in london getting the train from here so i was going down to london one once a week so i was reading one on the train once a week so i read it over six weeks it was just a just a, such a fantastic experience to to complete one every single time you went to london and back again and you sort of got to the end of it and it was just, and you couldn't wait for the next one. It was like box setting a Netflix. It was just incredible. For us, we got them um, each month when they came out. Um, so when one ended with Percy Wetmore stamping on a mouse, we just spent a month sitting outside the bookshop, hammering <laughs> on the door. So like, Give us the next one. When is it, please? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we needed to know what happened. It was just wonderful writing and yeah, yeah the full tension building absolutely adored that yeah did you ever read why he did it um yes i did but what have you read he, he was basically wanted to bring it out like charles dickens because charles yeah. dickens books used to be re released in america as chat books not as full amounts so he wanted to write under those conditions to be able to, because he didn't write them all apparently before they started getting published. His idea was to have the first two written and ready to go, and so and then when the first one got published is when he started writing the third one, so that he would put himself under pressure to bring to bring the story round to to have the the deadlines for each one coming out, which apparently is what Charles Dickens used to do. That's a um. One second, is that your alarm going off? Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's a hell of a brave thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. Because, um, I mean, you and I have both started stories and you will get to that midway point and then think, do you know what I need to put back in chapter one? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and you're, you're on chapter three. And, I mean, the planning must have been immense. Yes. You know, he, that, there's no way that he wrote that going along. That was, that was planned to the inth going along you know i mean i doubt he did do that do it that i think he actually wrote all six of them and just put that out as a story but i don't care i think it's a great <laughs> he's saying it's a great story to put out there but that's also apparently why he was writing the recaps so that he would be on you know making sure that he sort of picked it up almost like a having a having a game of exquisite corpse with himself you know yeah no one of my favorite stories Really, really enjoyed it. Um, I thought the characters in it were absolutely lovely. I mean, um, there's the religious suggestion in it with John Coffey having the same initials as Jesus Christ, with him having the healing power in his hands, with the state murdering him, um, with the fact that his story is being written down by somebody called Paul. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are all these religious things that we can see through it, which are just... Um, which is just so entertaining and well laid out. Yeah. And and that's it for me. That's why, as a writer, um, everything about it, the dogma, the way that he wrote it, the the planning of it, and like you say, is all the, there's just so many little underlying layers that, that 
come from the whole thing. Like breaking him out. There's there's an absolute brilliant. They broke him out of prison to go and heal the warden's wife and then put him back in prison again, knowing that he was capable of doing this rather than, oh, go and then pretend to beat me up and then bugger off to another part of the country. They actually put him back in prison again to see out this this sentence. It's it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. I say yeah. I understand why they cut certain bits out of it for the film. I thought the film was good, um, well acted, but it just missed, I think, a lot of the nuances that came from those little books. Yeah. And I think part of the for me, one of the main parts of the experience was that tension of I'm on a cliffhanger and I'm just dangling there for a month and there's no way a film can keep you dangling for a month. No. But, you know, a Netflix series could. It could, couldn't it? Yeah, that would make a... Can you imagine that as a six-parter on Netflix? As each each book told within each part and released over six months? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. people would hate that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that would be bloody brilliant, Mr. Netflix. If you're out there listening, listen to this. You know, we are on YouTube. You're supposed to be listening to what we're saying so that you can give us adverts. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Pull your finger out, Mr. Netflix, and yeah. uh, do that. Yeah. That would be because... awesome. That would be absolutely awesome. That would be, yeah. Quite fantastic. Um, so, next week. Next well, Well, I've got to ask the question, Ash, after that, brilliance after that genius yeah after that making us both think oh my god why are we even bothering in this writing game when that perfection already exists what are we reading next week um right um are you a member of any societies colin me yeah i'm a member of the blackpool horror society mm -hmm. and i'm a member of the national association of writers in education any others and the hg well society you should mention that, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, okay, yeah. Um, he wrote a story, um, that starred Tom Cruise, um, when it became a film. He wrote War of the Worlds, he the did, War yes, Worlds, yes. Now, I'm not suggesting that we read War of the Worlds, I'm suggesting that we listen to Orson Welles's version of War of the Worlds. Oh, now there are, there's a very interesting story about that, actually, yes. Not just, the, not just the, the famous one, which we will discuss next week, but H.G. Uh, Wells, if I, and I will find the source of the story, but H.G. Wells actually thanked Orson Wells for that adaptation, because War of the Worlds, a co contrary to popular myth, was not a big hit when it first came out until after that radio performance. So I found it on YouTube. Um, so, yeah, I will send you a link to that. Um, but, yeah, that's what we're listening to this week. Absolutely fantastic. And it, it will give us a chance to talk about all the different adaptations as well. But but that one, yeah, absolutely. There's so much to, so much to discuss within it. Brilliant. Send that link over to me. That's what we're doing next week. Yes, 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 yes. Excellent stuff. <laughs> okay, yeah. then, dude. Thank really you so much. That. Yeah, Thank wonderful, you. wonderful chat. Thank you so much um, for doing this because I just love this so much. I really do. Likewise. So, Likewise. Anyway, I'll see you next time, Ash. See you in a bit. See you later, man. Bye-bye.